Hi everyone, I'm Spiro with Newsbud.com. Today's roundtable discussion will be focused on the refugee crisis. I have three wonderful and well-traveled guests for this huge topic that's been affecting millions of people worldwide. Joining me is the editor and publisher of Newsbud, Sabelle Edmonds, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, and Newsbud's own Professor Philip Kovacevic from the brand new show, Russian Newspaper Monitor. Now, the Syrian civil war has been called the worst humanitarian crisis of our time. Uh, millions of people have been fleeing their countries uh, as a result of the conflict taking place in Syria. Uh, recently, uh, Sibel and I made a trip to Europe to investigate the Syrian refugee crisis, and it was a, a rather interesting and eye-opening trip, I must admit myself. Uh, soon we're going to have a series detailing our reports and interviews from our trip. But Sabelle, I'd like to ask you just briefly, can you tell me some of your thoughts on our trip? Sure, absolutely. Let me briefly mention the fact that we were not really planning to go to Greece and do this case and investigate the case. I was in Europe for another reason, for a short trip. Uh, Spiro Skouras, of course, he's Greek, and he was in Greece for a totally different reason. And uh, the case basically fell on our lap, and it was like a last-minute decision for me to go there and the two of us covering uh, uh, this whole issue of uh, refugee, Syrian refugee crisis, as it's known around the world, in Greece, uh, particularly in this uh, on this particular island, Lesbos, where one of the first stops for the refugees in Greece and the refugee camps there. And before that, a year before that, uh, I was in Turkey and I spent two months in the region, southern portion of Turkey, in the border of Syria, and uh, with million and a half, two million Syrian refugees. So I went there being kind of thought I was really familiar with the general landscape and situation of the refugee crisis based on what I had observed in Turkey with the Syrian refugees. But what we ended up encountering, what I ended up seeing, what we ended up investigating and finding out was a totally different uh, phenomenon, landscape, than what I had observed in, in Turkey. Uh, one of the main differences, for example, I immediately started seeing people who didn't look Syrians. And I started asking questions and they said, maybe about 75, 80% of these refugees are from Syria. But the rest, the other 20%, are from Yemen, Iraq, Afghanistan, Somalia, and, and Libya. And this kind of was uh, interesting because those were not the people I had observed in Turkey a year previous to this. They were all from Syria coming across the border. So then Spiro and I started looking into, well, you know, if you look at the map, um, I hope that our great editors here will put the map here and put Greece, and in this particular case, Lesbos Island, and show Turkey, Syria, and then show Somalia, Yemen, Afghanistan, Iraq, and then say, and Libya, and say, well, you're not looking crossing border refugees from one country coming there. You are looking at this really <laughs> intensive travel and voyage to get yourself into Europe, which was one of the most interesting things. Uh, and then the other thing I want to emphasize here, I counted the countries. So if you look at the countries and, and listen to the countries, Yemen, a country war-torn by the United States through its proxy, Saudi Arabia, okay? Afghanistan, another country we went and bombed and destroyed. Iraq, another one of U.S. wars. And Somalia and Libya. So you're looking at nations torn apart via wars created by the United States and NATO. So these are the countries we have gone and have uh, been aggressors towards. And this, uh, these are the countries these people were coming from. So that was one observation. The other very, very important observation we made and we investigated, and we are going to cover it with Spiro, was the fact that it's a known fact that American um, operatives, okay, NATO Western operatives and operatives from Turkey, they are funneling, actually encouraging these people to leave their countries and come into Europe. In fact, there were people there who showed us 
the knives given to them by American soldiers. Is that correct, Spiro? And, uh, and they also said they had gotten U.S. dollars. And they were told in which days certain bombings were going to take place. And they had actually uh, guided them into the route get to, to get them into Europe. That is very interesting. You don't see any mainstream media reporting on this. They said, yes, Americans, American forces, NATO forces were the ones who were actually providing us with this stuff and getting us out of these countries. Ha! Huh. Same thing with Turkey and Turkey's role in this, which is, again, very interesting. And most interestingly was the fact that from people, from the refugees themselves in the camps that we spoke with, but also with other p witnesses that we interviewed and we talked with, among these real refugees, let's say Syrian refugees war from war-torn countries, it's a known fact that intentionally certain so-called ISIS people were also being placed and mixed among them. And the fact that, that the, their identity was known to the higher powers, whether those higher powers or whatever tier number they are within the, within the Western forces, that the fact that they were blending in and refugees were traumatized by that. They, they said they were living in this climate of fear inside these camps, okay? Because they could identify and know the, the ISIS elements, some Afghan Taliban elements that were mixed in with them. And even when Spear and I were observing, we could tell the difference between the types of people. In some cases, in refugees, they were dealing with the cases of rapes. Uh, and the fact that some of these people were involved by being in touch by higher powered people in gun trafficking, in passport trafficking, in drug trafficking. In fact, one of the boats that they brought, you know, s several dozens of refugees into Lesbos, as they evacuated them, they left several bags of hashish originating from Afghanistan in the boats. So, uh, and the fact that these people, they travel and they get to a certain point with passports and then they dispose of their passports, they blend in, they say they are Syrian refugees and nobody can tell really how many nationalities they are dealing with and what is taking place. But one known fact on the ground was on purpose, certain ISIS, so-called ISIS terrorist elements were being placed with the real refugees and being funneled throughout the Europe with the first one of the first stops after Turkey being Greece. Did I leave out anything, Spiro, from the macro picture? It's so hard to, to give macro pictures when we have had so many different elements of these refugee crises. There, there was uh, a lot there, and uh, we're going to be detailing a lot of this in our upcoming series. We did visit one of the uh, refugee camps there in uh, on the island of Lesvos, and it was right after there was a, a fire that was reported by the press, by the media, and they were saying that there was a riot and clash was with police, and that the camp was almost entirely burnt to the ground, and and we we drove to the camp and went there and um, found a very different story. So, uh, going to be detailing this. Keep stay tuned. Oh yes. I really have to emphasize what Spiro said. He's absolutely correct. The stories that they wrote about what was happening with this fire and riots, completely bogus. The fire area was not even, I would say, 20 square feet. There were no riots. There were some people who were complaining. There were no riots. They were saying, we are here out in this limbo. We don't know what is the final destination country is for us. It, some of them saying we want to go back to Syria because miserable, slow death like this is worse than having a quick death in, in Syria. But there were no riots. There was no big fire. We were there. We went there. We took photos. What the, the media did and the social media and the so-called alternative media was completely, completely false, completely false. Professor Philip Kovacevic, you have uh, an upcoming uh, research paper that you're doing on this uh, subject, and I was hoping you could provide us with a bit of background on this topic. Yes, thank you, Spiro. The key question for me is whether these refugees or migrants 
can be used uh, to attain certain geopolitical or foreign policy goals. In other words, can they be weaponized in order to put pressure or blackmail some, some states by some other states? And here I would like to re refer to the work of Kelly Greenhill and her book, Weapons of Mass Migration, which was published in 2010 by Cornell University Press. And what, what she has done in this book is she has shown that, yes, this has been the case. And it, in fact, this is quite frequent and it's more successful than, than what people would expect. So let me give you, let me give you some statistics and let me compare this method of non-military coercion to some other methods of non-military coercion, such as, for instance, economic sanctions. So let's look at briefly at research of Kelly uh, Greenhill. She has studied uh, the period from 1951 to 2006. And the reason she starts with 1951 is that this was the year when the UN Convention on, on Refugees was signed which assigned legal status to refugees and also gave obligations to the states about the refugees. So she's looking at this period of about 55 years. And what she has discovered is that every single year from 1951 to, to 2006, there was at least one attempt of using mass movements of population to attain foreign policy goals. And typically, it was used by weaker states, by non-democratic states against liberal democracies, so-called liberal democracies. And there is a reason for that. The reason for that is that liberal democracies are in a certain paradox between the rhetoric of liberal democracy, human rights, and freedom of movements, and the actual policies that they're implementing. So in other words, these other states, in order to gain some foreign policy advantages against militarily stronger states, they are playing on the hypocrisy of liberal democracies. And so if we look at statistics, we see that most of these cases have actually been successful. In fact, according to the research of Kelly Greenhill, we have total success in 57% of the cases. And we have at least partial success in 75% of the cases. In other words, in most cases, this was attempted, it was successful. And in her book, she specifically studies the Cuban refugee crisis and the relations between Cuba and the United States. And she looks at three different historical events, three times that Cuba has sent a lot of immigrants into the United States and she concludes that every single time when the Cuban government has done that, they were able to gain some advantages from the United States government. So this, this uh, uh, method of using refugees for foreign policy goals is not something that's rare. It's something that is used quite frequently. The second issue here is that it is very successful. And in fact, it is more successful than using economic sanctions. Because during the same time period, the economic sanctions were successful only in 33% of the cases. Whereas I said, that using the refugees as, 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 as tools of pressure and blackmail was successful for 56% of the cases. Also, let's look at the US coercive uh, diplomacy, so-called coercive dip diplomacy. The U.S. coercive diplomacy was even less successful in the same time period than using economic sanctions. It was successful only at about 25% of the cases. In other words, the U.S. military was only successful in about 25% of the cases to attain the stated goals of the United States foreign policy. So think about that. You know, the, the, US, the U.S. is paying so much for the military and it's been successful only one quarter of the times. I mean, something's wrong here. So to, to go back to this, to this concrete event in Turkey and in the Middle East and in Europe, we may look at, we may look at this situation. We may look at the so-called refugee crisis of 2015 of last year as, as a, a, a game between certain countries in the Middle East and the European Union. And perhaps there was somebody else behind these countries in the Middle East, perhaps the United States. And in fact, if we look at the framework, 
that Kelly Greenhill established, she is looking at three different types of actors, the generators, the agent provocateurs, and the opportunists, all directed against the target state. So in my opinion, perhaps, let's say, let's say that perhaps uh, Turkey was the generator of some of these flows into Europe, but the agent provocateurs who incited Turkey into doing that perhaps were some powers behind the screen. You know, they wanted this to happen. They wanted this to be as big as possible. They pressured the Turkish government or blackmailed it to do it. And then the opportunist would be perhaps the countries of the Balkans, which have used the refugees, the refugees who had to pass through their territories to attain some of their own goals vis-a-vis the European Union. And I would, for instance, point out that the Serbian government played this game really well. And the target was the European Union. So the ultimate target was the European Union. Well, that's definitely interesting. And if you look at all the timing of it and the, all the research and the history, uh, things start to come together uh, and to formulate a picture. And if you look at the refugee crisis, like you said, it was mainly promoted throughout the media in 2015. Uh, that was right around the same time that the UN was having their General Assembly in New York City in Manhattan. And when they launched the 2030 agenda and the Pope was there giving their blessings, encouraging other countries to take in all of the refugees. As you said, it can be used as a tool of successful manipulation type of warfare. But it's, it's interesting that what I found interesting was how the World Bank was also getting involved with certain biometric companies and they were pushing a huge biometric database to keep track of all the refugees. The media would promote and hype um, some violent clashes that had taken place, for example, and, and how are we going to keep track of all these refugees. Meanwhile, they already had all these plans in the works for these tracking uh, databases through biometrics, through uh, facial recognition, iris, fingerprints, you name it. Uh, so then you have the, the UN uh, in their own 2030 agenda, uh, items goal 16.9, they're stating that they want to have a global uh, registration, a global birth registration. And so you start to see all these things coming together and, they're, and all of a sudden this refugee crisis is booming and you have all these NGOs getting involved and so many different uh, aspects, um, players getting involved here. Uh, you have to wonder, it makes you wonder, uh, you know, what is really going on here? And as Sabelle pointed out earlier, it's all being driven from war-torn countries that the U.S. is getting involved in and oftentimes uh, not even declared, some would say, uh, illegal wars. Uh, I'd like to bring in James Corbett at this point in time. What, what are some of the big uh, lingering questions hanging out there at this point? Well, I think what Dr. Kovacevic was pointing out there is so important about the different categories of people that are operating here. The, you've got the generators, you've got the agent provocateurs, and you've got the opportunists. And I would add another category into that, which is the, uh, I don't want to use the word patsy, I don't think that's the right word, but the, the, uh, the, the, the obvious, again, even terrorist is the wrong word, because that implies a certain, they're operating for a certain reason. I think mercenary is probably the best way of, of talking about these, uh, these characters that are being inserted into the, the, the refugee mix to create the, uh, the, the terrorist threat. Um, to Europe. Um, so I, I guess we'll I'll refer to them as patsies just as a shorthand for now until we can think of a better term. But that's it's interesting to me that, of course, the media narrative, either the mainstream or the alternative media narrative has focused to some extent on the generators like Turkey um, of the of the crisis who have facilitated the flow of these migrants. And that has created tensions between Europe and Turkey, for example. Um, there has been focus to a certain extent, on the um, the opportunists, uh, uh, as uh, Dr. Kovacevic was talking about, the Balkan states, uh, Italy, other other states that have been facilitators of of moving these migrants through through our borders up to Germany and you know places that'll be able to take take better care of them. Um, so there's been some, obviously, certainly within uh, a lot of the the alt media space in Europe uh, at this point. There's a lot of talk about that and. And uh, the 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 how there's there's more tensions now in that sense, 
but there has been and and of course there's always the focus on the patsies the 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 terrorist threats i mean these are the the boogeymen that are coming to kill you and your wife and your children and everything so this is the the kind of big the big boogeyman in all of this but there has been zero as far as i can tell or as close to zero as possible attention to the agent provocateurs who are the ones that are inciting this making this happen and for what purpose and in fact if you answer that question for what purpose you start to see the who they are and in fact i'll give one very specific example because it presents itself nicely let's play a little game i'm going to read you guys a quotation you tell me who said this quotation the refugee crisis in Europe was already pushing the European Union toward disintegration when, on June 23rd, it helped drive the British to vote the Bre to Brexit the EU. The refugee crisis and the Brexit calamity that it spawned have reinforced xenophobic nationalist movements that will seek to win a series of upcoming votes, including national elections in France, the Netherlands and Germany in 2017, a referendum in Hungary on the EU refugee, refugee policy on October 2nd, which already played out with interesting results if you want to get into, and a rerun of the Austrian presidential election on December 4th. Rather than uniting to resist this threat, EU member states have become increasingly unwilling to cooperate with one another. They pursue self-serving, beggar-thy-neighbor migration policies, such as building border fences, that further fragment the Union, seriously damaging member states, and subvert global human rights standards. This is unfortunate because the EU cannot survive without a comprehensive asylum and migration policy. Who said it? I'm going to guess, uh, go out on a limb here and say Soros, George Soros. Ping pong, yes, of course. It's Soros, yes, <laughs> uh, of course. And, and I don't want to bring Soros in as the boogeyman who's always pointed to, because he is always pointed to, but it is a pretty good representative example of the financier parasite class and the, the, the machinations that make their, uh, their, 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 their end goal more realistic. And what is the end goal here? It is the creation of a united a European identity, a European, uh, even, I mean, in the, in the larger sense, identity, in the more specific sense, institutions that cohere and are more centralized. And that is exactly, exactly what is happening as a result of this. You are getting a strengthening of European institutions because of this. It is, it, it involves the the disintegration or at least the pulling apart of Europe in order to bring about the need, oh, there's a crisis, now we have to, now we have to cohere more tightly. And I, th I see that as one, one of the strategies um, that is at play here. I don't think it's the only one. You brought in an interesting point about the, uh, the biometrics. I mean, I, that's, that's another whole area in here. And, uh, and again, we don't have to look very hard to see what types of bodies and agencies and people are, are promoting this. Um, for example, back last year, uh, as this crisis was playing out, as you point out, the UN heavily involved here, well, the UN came out with a statement back in the middle of 2015 um, when there had already been 224,000 migrants and refugees that had made their way to Europe um, by that point in uh, 2015. And the UNHCR urged European countries to provide more places for refugees through resettlement programs, family reunification, humanitarian admission, private sponsorship schemes, and work and education visas. Again, this is being pushed by the UN. This is being pushed by Soros and the financier class. This is being pushed by the European Union itself, which um, obviously different member states have different uh, positions on this, but the European Union as a bureaucratic institution ultimately benefits from this in the creation of that cohesion. This crisis is doing what no politician could ever dream of doing, which is creating that European identity, that European sense that it is now Europe versus this outside threat. So we have to come together, right, Europe? Um, and it's, of course, it's playing out in nationalist context right now and with national nation states against it. But the logic of that system is the nation states feed into the European bureaucracy and ultimately the EU bureaucracy wins out on this. That is one of the various things at play here. The other one goes back to what you were saying earlier, Sibel, about the U.S., and NATO facilitating the flow of these refugees by creating the situation and and facilitating the actual movements is interesting because that can be seen as part of this. There is a narrative that you could paint here. It is U.S. The U.S. is waging war on Europe. Um, you can see that not only through this crisis and the various ways that this has been 
generated, to use that term, by the United States, but also um, in, in, in other uh, factors. For example, the EU sanctions on Russia, which were really done to go along with the U.S. demonization of Russia as part of the U.S. destabilization of Ukraine, which was all the Russians' fault, is hurting Europe more so than it's hurting U.S. and debatably more so than it's hurting Russia. It's hurting Europe um, primarily. And now Europe is becoming more at loggerheads with Russia. It's going to have to do something about this new Turkish stream. Are they going to start, you know, blockading uh, or or at least trying to wean themselves off of gas from Turkey now? uh, All of this can be seen as U.S. machinations trying to weaken Europe. And I, I guess you could just see it in a 2D geopolitical sense. That's U.S. versus Europe. Um, and the U.S. is trying to get a comparative advantage. I see it on the broader scale. No, again, I think this is about pulling Europe apart at the seams in order to get that 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 reaction, that cohesion, um, and trying to build up a stronger European Union, um, which is uh, interesting. So I'm just going to put that on the table and let you guys tell me what you think about that. You know, I, I think what's happening is that within Europe, we have two factions. We have the Atlanticists and the Eurasianists. And I think it's, it's a struggle between these two ideological blocks. The Atlanticists want to have eventually a federation with the United States. The idea here is to have Europe federated with the United States and Canada and to have a, 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 a bigger federation and to organize it according to the United States uh, rules, laws, and regulations of, 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 of uh, no, basically no regulation, the GMO food, and so on and so forth. Well, there is the opposition to this, and it's found in France and perhaps also in Germany, is the Eurasianist side. They, they, for instance, follow the directives of Charles de Gaulle, who said that he wanted Europe from Lisbon to the Urals. In other words, Europe, that includes also Russia. And so, so uh, uh, at, this, at this point of time, I think the Atlanticist faction is losing out. And this is why this faction is creating all of this. So it's, it, it, it's putting pressure, especially on Germany, because Germany will be the most affected by the refugees. And in fact, most of these refugees have gone to Germany, more than one million of them. Uh, of course, compared to the total German population, which is about 80 million, it's not it's not a whole lot. But if, as Sibel says, there are many suspicious individuals within them, we may expect a lot of instability. And as we know, in today's climate of fear, it's enough for one bomb to go off in a big city of five million people and for the whole city to be shut down. So the reaction is disproportionate to the event. This is why I think we may see even more attacks in Germany and also in in France. We also have to take into consideration that the French elections, the French presidential elections are coming up. And and, and this goes well with Putin canceling visit to France at the last minute just yesterday, because I guess Hollande did not want to meet with him. The reason is... Putin is going to support Sarkozy. Can you believe that? Sarkozy, the ultimate Atlanticist, has now gone on to the other side because he does come out of this goalist heritage. And so, so, so uh, you know, uh, Hollande's not meeting Putin is actually, is actually connected to the elections coming up in France. So we have to look at all these different, different levels and, of course, express our ultimate compassion for the refugees for the actual refugees, people who lost their homes all over the Middle East and North Africa and Central Asia. These are people who are being manipulated, who are used as weapons. And this is tragic and this has to stop. Well, there is one um, pretty immediate consequence of this that we are able to observe. And especially when you speak with people who live, let's say people in Greece, the, especially the areas in Greece that are mostly affected by these refugee crises. And when you speak with the people there, with the Greeks, they tell you one of the immediate consequences of this has been giving birth to the rise of extreme right and the extreme left 
that they say we had not observed in decades and decades. So what happened, for example, if if we were to present Lesbos as as example, initially everybody on the island they were they were generous, wonderful, warm people, and they rushed to help and bring in these refugees and take care of them and give them clothes. This is they said before any of the NGOs started drive, uh, coming in into their island, and they said it's amazing. So many of these NGOs that they said they are observing are bogus. They have been just quickly created to come and blend in with some of the, you know, better known NGOs. But regardless, what it caused in this in this particular island was immediately with the alternative, the pseudo alternative media, mainstream media playing it, their their bloodline, their lifeline was tourism. It ended their tourism. So you had all these British tour operators, tourism oper operating agencies, uh, other European, German, French, they all canceled their, their reservations in the hotels there. I would say over 80% of the people there, their livelihood depends on tourism. And most of them work very hard, seven days a week, almost 24 by seven for five months. And then they don't have jobs for five, six months. They have to save enough to live off of that. So with their tourism being completely stopped, thanks to the media embellishing and putting lies after lies about this excruciating situation and all this horrific scenery in Lesbos, which was never the case. We were all over the place, okay? Their livelihood got lost. So you got a, a large segment unemployed, also seeing some of the other consequences of these refugees and the camp there. So they started feeling resentful. They were being, they, they, they had resentment. They started saying, and their kids, okay, I'm talking about teenagers feeling, being filled with hatred, saying because of these darn Muslims, because of these darn refugees, now we, don't, we can't eat, we don't have bread on the table, right? And as this started happening, this resentment, mysterious ultra-right, neo-Nazi, whatever you want to call them, they started coming in and putting fuel in this fire that was being created with the resentment and recruiting that segment with resentment into the what we call, what we dub as extreme right, the, the, the neo-Nazi, whatever you want to call them. Then you have the island divided, which they never had in their history to this degree. She's, I mean, the people we are talking with, they're saying this is, this is on, you know, this is just, we've never experienced anything like this. Now there's a feud, there's a war between two segments that didn't exist. The ultra left, the ultra liberal, and the ultra right. And it all started and developed and escalated with this refugee crisis. Well, we see the same phenomena all over Europe. We see the same rise of the extreme right and extreme left in Germany. We are seeing it everywhere in the Balkans, even to a certain degree, we see this. And that to me also goes into this tactic of divide and conquer with the establishment. In fact, one of the Greeks on the island said, basically, they are replicating the situation in your country. This is being the USA with Trump and Hillary Clinton in these small little places, countries all over Europe between between the two segments. So we are experiencing the same thing you have put in place in your country. And when you start thinking about that and this consequence, again, it goes into the Soros modus operandi, divide and conquer, pit the blacks against the white, pit the Jews against the Muslim, pit the Christians against. I mean, that is what we are seeing as the result of these artificially or synthetically created uh, refugee, so-called refugee crisis. And we have to look at the ultimate beneficiaries. But I tell you what, even with these refugee crises, without the mainstream media and the pseudo alternatives playing their role, let's say in the case of this Greek island, by putting lies and embellishing the stuff that what's happening on the island, that those agendas would not be served. What is enabling uh, the, 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 the goal, the objectives, you know, for, for the objectives to be accomplished is the mainstream media and ma mainstream media and pseudo alternative media playing their very important role, how they are writing it day after day, whether there is some incident that has never occurred or is a small little incident that has been contained, but they embellish and they exaggerate. 
they are inducing this feeling of hatred between the population, between different segments. This is why when, when we were talking with some of the Turkish people, they kept saying, you see, we told you since 9-11 is all about restarting crusaders. Because by doing this, they want to create this hatred towards Muslim and Islam. And this is what George Bush wanted. This is what Soros has always wanted so that we, they can get the Europe also together with U.S., on board in all these attacks that we are seeing all over the Middle East. And we are going to see these attacks in some of the stands because we're going to have similar situation with Chechens. It has been put placed on pause, but it's going to start again. So that is one of the immediate consequences that you right away see in Europe, especially in Greece. And that is the extreme, very rapid, speedy rise of extreme right and extreme left. Well, those are great points there, and uh, you know you're absolutely right about the extremes on on both sides uh, being uh, fomented and and culminating. And uh, like the locals that we were speaking with there described themselves as being caught in the middle, and each side was just as bad as the other. I mean, it was it wasn't like oh one side's better than the other. But I think it's important to remember also, like uh, Professor Kovacevic stated earlier, uh, that. Uh, the the people at the end of the day are are the victims. Whether it's the the refugees, whether it's the uh, the locals, and this is all being caused, or you know, it's all because of ISIS. Uh, you know, this this all of these calamities that are taking place, all of these humanitarian crises that are taking place, it's it's all because of what because ISIS is trying to destabilize, you know, overthrow Assad. Um, I mean, and it's all war-torn countries that the West is in there tearing it up. I mean, it's, uh, you, I mean, there was, I've even read reports over the last year stating how ISIS mercenaries were claiming that they had infiltrated uh, their own jihadis in with the refugees and they've, you know, thousands in Europe and, and everything like that, um, and that they were going to... They even predicted that this refugee crisis was going to take place before it happened. So, I mean, in my own opinion, if ISIS was as real as the mainstream media portrays them to be, we could have eliminated them and taken them, wiped them off the face of the planet a long time ago. And I don't think that these guys are able to orchestrate uh, this massive migration uh, movement right now against all of these uh, developed countries with their massive surveillance programs and their massive police states and militaries and and we can't we're just sitting here like we you know it's ISIS they're coming to get us so um, a very very interesting uh, points that all three of you have made today here I, I really enjoy uh, our conversation and it's and it's still a, an ongoing issue that that's still affecting millions and millions of people and it's going to continue to do it and I think Sabelle you nailed it on the head with uh, the divide and conquer tactic, and it's happening on so many different levels. Um, I'd like to ask each one of you if you have any any final points. My final point is that we have to look at closely at the relations between Turkey and Russia. Uh, we have to understand the mind of, of Erdogan because he is still trying to play with both sides. Uh, I mentioned in one of the last podcasts that Turkey had a real opportunity to stop expansion of NATO. Ex the expansion of NATO is one of the biggest critiques that Russia has had since the end of the Cold War. And Turkey could have stopped it by not ratifying the accession protocol with Montenegro. And they did not. The Turkish parliament ratified the accession agreement with Montenegro, which means that Turkey is not going to leave NATO anytime soon, which means that, that the deals that signed with Putin may not work out in the end. But this puts Turkey as a country in a very difficult situation because, because I, I, I think the West and the East will try to, to put a lot of pressure on it and perhaps even try to cause huge disturbances in Turkey. So I think it's time for Erdogan to choose sides. That is to move from the West to the East and accept and accept a strategic alliance with Putin and the Chinese, because otherwise 
he is going to be destroyed and Turkey may be in big trouble coming up. Uh, let me reinforce what I think the point that Sabella was making there so forcefully and so rightly is that this is about divide and conquer. So from the internal European perspective, you have the atomization of society with people being pushed, neighbors being pulled apart and put on different sides of this. And it enters into a, a globalist versus nationalist dialectic. And, uh, well, the globalists ultimately win that dialectic because the logic of the situation dictates that ultimately, once you atomize the population, then everyone can squabble with each other and they may be able to form their little nationalist cliques, but those cliques are going to have to collaborate in the European Union. It is going to be scooped up. Those pieces are going to be scooped up by Brussels and made into a more cohesive whole. I think ultimately this serves the agenda of the the Soroses and all of the other financiers and other people who are the agent provocateurs behind this, ultimately. Um, this creates the, uh, and, and I think we see that in the alternative media focus on, or the alternative, quote unquote, media focus on the, uh, the, 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 the pawns in this game, the, the refugees, the migrants, the, the terrorist mercenaries who have been embedded amongst them. Um, that focus creates the, the hatred of, uh, of, uh, your uh, of your neighbors, I mean, in the sense that uh, it, it pits the 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 right versus the left and all of that atomization. Um, the mainstream media focuses on more of the generators part and the and the uh, the facilitators of this crisis. Oh, the crisis isn't the the refugees and migrants and and mercenaries. The crisis is the fact that Europe doesn't have a cohesive policy. Um, that creates the real question in my mind and not one that I ne necessarily have a definitive answer for, what is the ultimate solution to this? Because I think both of those, pointing at those as the problems, for the average person in Europe, what do you actually do about this? Um, because ultimately you are being used as a pawn as well to bring in a much bigger geopolitical agenda. So what is the ultimate solution? I don't think the solution is going to come by voting in Le Pen in France or, you know, any of these types of nationalist candidates. I don't think that's the ultimate solution. But then what is the actual solution? And that's something that I think needs to, uh, there need to be more people asking that question and realizing that the problem is the divide and conquer and pitting people against their neighbors. Well said, James. And uh, Philip, I really would like to have a a really nice lengthy roundtable talking about the recent changes in Turkey, the change of heart, the change of position. And, and we, we should do that very soon because the consequences are not only for the Balkans, but uh, Turkey is in a very precarious uh, position right now. And yes, President Erdogan has been playing both sides. And uh, and I really would love for us to have a roundtable on that and, and organize and set it up to have it soon. And uh, James, uh, just uh, quickly, I want to mention this thing with mainstream media. Uh, the, the immigrants started arriving there during the month of March. It's cold. They are coming on these 28, 30 feet boats, 17, 20 people in them, some of them women with the babies and everything. To just tell you how disgusting the mainstream media and these people are, said, so, well, they are, they are cold. We want to right away give them food and dry clothes, etc. And, and some of the mainstream media were making them, you know, but they're under shock, some of these refugees, just going through that whole voyage in the water, middle of the night, it's below zero degrees. And they were making these, well, some of these women to drop their babies in the water and then go and rescue them and have retakes, have retakes. She was saying, we are so afraid from hypothermia, okay? And, uh, and, and people, most likely CNN, is saying, let's have that scene again. Let's have a better take. Throw the baby. Throw the baby in the ice water. Now grab. Okay, she's shivering. So it is just treating it like some damn Hollywood movie. And she, this one particular lady was saying, just so disgusting, the Western media, and how they milk it, how they treat this, and what they portray, and what, what the length. They, they go through to, 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 to come up with the script that they want to present per their, you know, whoever are their bosses, and we all know who they are. But my last comment is going to be, I know we've been discussing this for quite a while. Um, 
James, your video that you did on the beheading of the 12-year-old boy, because my daughter, she's eight years old, and I, I had her sit and watch that. And, and uh, I, we had to have a discussion with my husband. You know, I don't think, I think, I said, it's the right thing for her to watch. I want her to know, you know, the things that we are doing. Because my father started that with me when I was six, seven years old. So, and I don't believe psychologically it damaged me too much. <laughs> But uh, I have kind of survived it, but I I'm trying to instill the same kind of compassion and critical thinking in her as my father did with me. But your video, um, it, it urged people and, 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 and brought the point of how urgent this is. And, and the, this refugee crisis and what these people are going through is very similar, not as maybe horrendous, but Every single day, and I was telling Spiro this, I was saying every day that we in the United States, okay, maybe we in the Germany, sitting and having dinner, having our daily routine, there are thousands of people who are losing their homes. There are tens of thousands of people who are bleeding. There are hundreds of people who are being exploded by bombs, and there, there, are, there are hundreds of orphans being created. There are boys, 12-year-olds are being beheaded. Millions of people are turning into refugees. And where is that sense of urgency? I mean, we are looking at one of the most horrendous crises in the world created for no reason. And with that, I want to underline one observation which I made when I was in Turkey talking with the Syrian refugees. And when we were in Greece to a certain degree, you talk with them and I haven't heard, we haven't heard a single person saying this was caused by Assad. Bashar Assad is the reason. When you talk to them, we're going to have some of these. All of them unanimously say this is caused by the West. This is caused by the United States. And, and there was one man we interviewed there, one, one refugee from Syria, and he said, you know what this is about? This, and he's, he's pointing at these refugees, this misery. And he's saying, this is blood money for the West. Because there are people who are making billions of dollars out of this, out of what you're witnessing right now, out of what you're observing right now, out of this misery, there are billions of dollars. Take a look at the amount to spend on the military industrial complex. Take a look at these companies that have gotten $500 million in three years to make fake beheading videos, okay? This is, this is money. And this man, this, this, this refugee with limited English was, was pointing and saying, this is about blood money for the bosses in the West, the United States. This is blood money. And that is so true. And I tell you this, you go talk with these people. You will never hear one refugee, one injured person saying this is caused because of Assad. And that is something that I hope our viewers will take with them from this episode. And also, if they haven't watched this, to go and watch your video. It's a powerful video delivered very passionately. And start think about the sense of urgency. Why aren't we sitting and talking about Trump and Clinton? Why are we sitting and talking about some pity, ridiculous pseudo issues? When we, as nation, with our money, okay, with our consent, especially those of you who've been voting, we are creating this, okay? And the blood money they are talking about, that blood is in all our hands, okay? It is on our hands. And, and please feel that sense of urgency. I don't want this to go on, us informing you, presenting you this stuff. It is time to act. And as James said, let's come up with some possible solutions because the sense of urgency needs to be there. And unfortunately, I don't see it. It's becoming normalized. It is becoming normalized to read these atrocities caused by this very few people running the world. And that would be the end of my supposed uh, short comments, Spiro. Well, thank you, Sibel. You're right. You're absolutely right. And that's, that was very powerful because it's, it's the truth. And yes, I definitely would encourage everyone to go over it. For those of you who haven't seen it yet, over to Cobra Report and, and watch it, that video. It's very, very powerful, very real. It, it really brings it home to me, you know, even though I can't imagine uh, what it's like. So on that note, uh, I'd like to thank Sibel Edmonds for joining us, Professor Philip Kovacevic 
who has the new show, the Russian newspaper Monitor. It comes out on Fridays. Great show. Episode 2 is coming up this week. Looking forward to that. And CorbettReport.com. And obviously his YouTube channel, Corbett Report, as well. Tons of great content. Uh, be sure to follow NewsBud on Twitter. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. And there's always much more at our website. Reporting for NewsBud, this is Spiro. Thank you.